I think Veterans for Peace is one of the best organizations going uh, on this planet. I'm, I'm proud to say I'm on the advisory board of it. Um, and I did want to speak uh, very briefly to this notion of being upset that the U.S. military is not attending the conference in Glasgow in person. I, I don't want ExxonMobil attending either. I don't want the top criminals uh, sitting in the judges' seats in courts either. I want governments, for God's sake. Uh, doing the will of people uh, and setting laws and applying them. I want militaries controlled by civilians as long as they must exist. Um, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can share screen as well uh, and go through a bit of a PowerPoint here. And I think uh, great minds think alike. I will try to jump over anything that's redundant in terms of what you've already heard. Um, I. I I, 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 well, let me let me start with with this. I, I think it's important to put into the context of U.S. and Western culture part of the reason why uh, militaries can be left out of climate agreements. Uh, you know, the, the fundamental reason is because they can get away with it until we cease allowing them to get away with it. The same reason they leave out international shipping or livestock or anything else they can get away with. But they can get away with it because people are in the habit of viewing militaries as sort of part of the wallpaper, the background, the, the natural world, and not not including them in obvious places where they ought to be included in things like budget discussions, where in the US, the top news story for the past several weeks is the most enormous legislative bills in the history of forever. And, and yet, of course, they're smaller in annual spending, dramatically smaller than annual military spending, which, you know, doesn't exist in the US media. Uh, you know, the, the, the standards for, uh, pandemic uh, control our you know military bases are just left out above the rule of law uh, Hollywood movies about horrors like uh, forever chemical pollution the, the biggest contributor to which is militaries the militaries are left out uh, the US Congress most of whose members run for Congress without mentioning that 96 percent of humanity exists much less you know treaties wars peace uh, anything of the sort so we have a problem with getting military is to exist in normal conversation. Um, we have a petition set up, uh, Veterans for Peace and Peace Action Maine, and about 500 organizations and counting uh, have endorsed and about 25,000 individuals uh, have signed the petition at cop26.info and we're doing events uh, in Glasgow. Uh, and if you go to that website, you'll find links to more information and to all the events coming up both locally in Glasgow and elsewhere and globally uh, via the internet. Um, you heard a good deal about this already, but climate is only one bit of how militaries uh, destroy the natural environment, and and greenhouse gas emissions is only part of how they destroy the climate. Um, but and, and and I think it's it's worth noting the the key fact I think about the the burn pits that we heard about a minute ago uh, is the very credible uh, theory and extensive evidence that the current president of the United States had a son die of cancer as a result of, of burn pits uh, in U.S. wars uh, and, and doesn't seem to have phased him in terms of his support for, for militarism. Um, but, but militarism uh, it is absolutely devastating uh, to the land, to the water, to the air of this planet, not only in the places where the wars happen, which are ruined and in many cases are ruined forever and left unusable by, by endless toxins and depleted uranium and landmines and cluster mines. But even in the places to, that are supposed to be benefiting from all of these distant foreign imperial wars where the, the United States military uh, is the source of the vast majority of the major environmental disaster sites in the United States and is a top polluter of the water and land and air in the United States, uh, and we're supposed to put up with this. 
and the places where U.S. bases are imposed on the rest of the world abroad have no choice but to put up with it as long as those bases are there. They operate above the rule of law. They don't inform uh, or answer to the, the, the so-called host countries. Um, but when we look specifically at military greenhouse gas emissions, uh, it, it is absolutely huge. And, and I think it's worth restating, uh, though you've already heard it, that entire nation, about three quarters of the world, if you take each of those nations, three quarters of the nations of the world, if you take each of those nations, entire greenhouse gas emissions, military, civilian, and otherwise, it's less than just the U.S. military's greenhouse gas emissions, just what we know of with the current state of reporting. Uh, so it's not, you know, it, it's, it doesn't dominate U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, but it is on a global scale, major, incredibly significant, just the U.S. military. And when you add the other militaries to it, it's even more. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I went on I went on Russia TV about two days ago. Uh, and, you know, it's that th this is a television network that will have on people who will criticize the U.S. government in the way that U.S. corporate television networks will not. But then the hosts and experts pay, you know, hired by Russia TV, they hire them from Fox and CNN and they, you know, they're spouting the same crap as as you get on the U.S. networks. And so they they did this story where they push all the glories of the new Tesla tanks and all the developments of the uh, of the military and U.S. capitalism that are going to save us. Uh, and it was absolute nonsense. I, I mean, the vast majority uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions from the military are in the air, you know, and they weren't they weren't modeling any future vehicles that leave the ground. Uh, and what they were suggesting was, you know, a future sort of dream. And uh, and, and it overlooked, among other things, the money problem, you know, we, we, we can't we can't go and rebuild the U.S. military with with Tesla tanks, even if they had Tesla airplanes. We don't have the time or the money. We need the money for the problems we have no choice but to address, including the destruction of the climate. Um, so uh, looking at uh, looking at the, the, the U.S. military with the EU and the UK next to it. This is from a friend who, who studies the UK military uh, carbon emissions uh, in some detail, but occasionally throws in a graphic with the US in it and you see what it does to the, it just dwarfs the whole topic uh, of, of what the UK is, is doing. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, at worldbeyondwar.org, we've created a, a database of resources. If you click on resources or go to slash resources, uh, and you can put in a topic like environment and get a hundred and some resources, and you can click on a type of resource like articles or videos or comic books or children's books or reports or uh, videos or whatever. And so we've tried to put the very most useful things there, and you all can correct me after this meeting for in terms of what we've left out that ought to be there. Um, this is, you know, I mentioned already one of the horrible ways that the U.S. military is is polluting the the water of the world is with these chemicals that they use unnecessarily to put out fires that they practice putting out fires. Uh, and uh, a, a friend of ours, Pat Elder, has has created a website, militarypoisons.org, uh, if you want all the details you can imagine. Um, this is a nice fun fact I like to throw in here for the for the intersectionality, uh, as they call it. Uh, you know, the, 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 the heating of the earth is blowing up piles of weapons that are lying around on the earth. Um, you know, these two problems are interlocked in many, many, many ways, uh, but this is one new way. Um, I, you know, trying to, trying to break through this sort of magical force field that prevents most of the human species from knowing this problem exists at all, uh, I, I wrote a uh, Harry Potter story about uh, the secret of COP26 and the smoke belching train headed up to Glasgow for COP26 meeting. And uh, you can go read it at, at bit.ly slash COP26 Potter. Um, but I, I will give away the secret. The secret is they leave militaries out of the climate agreements. Um, 
the 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 big problem I have uh, with this topic, whenever it does get brought up, which is rare enough, uh, is that militaries are thought of as a sort of a solution rather than the problem. Um, you know, and 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 this is this is growing, uh, and the militarization of police in the United States, uh, in particular since the the new Congress and the new president, uh, when local police departments say the word climate, boom, they get tons of of military equipment from the federal government, uh, which of course they're not going to use in any way to address the climate. Uh, and we actually would benefit a great deal uh, from addressing fires and hurricanes and floods with unarmed people trained in, in expertise for addressing fires and hurricanes and floods. Uh, you know, one reason is that, you know, for many decades, the military has you, the US military has used natural disasters, uh, as they're called, as excuses to get into new territories and islands and never leave. You know, this is this is my understanding of the US Navy's motto of force for good. They're there for good. You know, they're, they're not leaving. They're not getting out. Uh, and and the, the, the whole idea of the military as a solution or that we should just swoon in, in admiration because the military admits the problem exists, you know, it's just not good enough. The military is a major driver of the pollution itself, uh, wages wars to control the fossil fuels with which to pollute further, uh, threatens wars to go after territories that are opening up as the ice melts, props up, gives arms and training and funding and support uh, to facilitating coups and to propping up brutal governments uh, in, in significant part for control of fossil fuels. Uh, you know, and, and, and the military's reports and NATO's reports, uh, the, the, the recommendations that come out of these institutions, what they would be saying if they were in those meetings in Glasgow, armed or otherwise, uh, is very, very little about Tesla tanks, uh, which the military uh, has not exhibited any interest in yet. It's just a Tesla thing. Uh, it's, it, it's mostly about adapting, which obviously we have no choice but to adapt. But if we're just adapting, we're going to very soon reach a situation we can no longer adapt to. <laughs> it has to be about ceasing to exacerbate the problem. Uh, and there you got very little from the military, but you do get militarization of borders, treating the victims as the enemies. Uh, you know, this is where deferring to the military on these questions leads you. Um, and, and then, of course, there's the other problem that we never mention uh, precisely because it wouldn't exist without militaries, uh, and that is the nuclear apocalypse, which has grown in likelihood, the risk of which has increased right alongside that of climate apocalypse. Uh, we just, you know, thank God we talk about one of them, uh, but we ought to talk about both. Um, and, and I know <laughs> we in this meeting all probably do, but uh, the larger we don't. Um, I uh, wanted to just show some numbers here. There, there was a, you know, proposal from President Biden early this year for climate aid to foreign governments. Uh, and if you put it as a graphic on a on a chart with so-called military aid, that is weaponry uh, and and other economic aid, uh, you know, actual non-weapons aid, uh, it, it just, you know, it's just negligible. Uh, and, and if you put U.S. government climate spending, uh, even proposed huge progressive climate spending next to fossil fuel subsidies, it doesn't measure up. So, you know, what sense does that make? And then if you throw military spending onto the same chart, you know, you, both of them become almost invisible. Um, and then uh, the goals, I, I should pull out the document I have on this if I'm going to talk about it, but the goals on the climate that President Biden proposed early this year for, you know, future decades uh, were just 
largely nonsensical and and full of you know speculative future technologies and things left out and loopholes uh but one of the key ones that's that's left out even by climate groups even by environmental organizations is the one that we're trying to force into the discussion and that is military climate destruction why in the world would you leave military climate destruction out of treaties to address climate destruction uh, i i i asked this of one uh you know advocate uh, of the sort of change we're looking for. Uh, and, and his answer was, well, the nations are so busy dealing just with the civilian problems, they can't get around it, which completely evades the question, right, of why divide matters into civilian and military. We don't have two planets. We just got the one planet. Why separate militaries, give them a waiver at all? Why not put them in the same basket with the same laws as as every other sector um things that can be done um i recommend everything you've already heard in terms of using the resources from veterans for peace uh i also recommend again going to cop26.info uh and looking at the links to uh particular upcoming events in the people's summit that are going to be online uh, uh resources for doing your own event on november 6th uh saturday week from saturday when uh the the big march is going to go through glasgow um look at info about the event we're doing on november 4th in downtown glasgow on this topic uh and keep pushing for a demilitarized green new deal uh and keep working to build local peace and environment alliances uh, because the big environmental groups, uh, you know, most of them, the ones with any money, the ones you've heard of, uh, they won't touch peace uh, with a 10 foot pole, but the local ones love to, you know, everybody's local chapter of Sierra Club and every other group more than happy uh, to build alliances and work for peace, just as peace activists are always happy to work for environmental causes. So if we build these alliances locally in enough places, we can influence the, the national and international organizations. Um, and, and I think this is the last slide I've got in here. I just wanted to throw this in as one tool, one sort of campaign that we do through World Beyond War and other allies um we just posted an article a couple of days ago about rotary club a huge global organization uh finally divesting from weapons uh this uh this photo is from my town of charlottesville virginia where we passed uh, a resolution uh to divest the city the public budget from both fossil fuel companies and weapons companies and they had money in both and they divested it uh it wasn't just you know to not invest in those horrible things in the future uh and it was a very educational process uh of you know presenting a resolution that made the connections between the two supposedly separate topics educated people in the process and you know and divested that those millions of dollars and did that little bit more to make profiting from war and profiting from environmental destruction into the shameful things they ought to be the scandalous things they ought to be for anyone to to get away with doing it shouldn't be the norm it shouldn't be acceptable and something rare and bizarre to demand divestment from them um so they're, they're you know work locally work globally and uh to the extent possible and useful uh and it's wonderful that vfp has has gone after john Kerry on this work nationally and uh we'll see what we can do thanks for including me here <laughs>